Um, we'll move next to Tony. And uh, Tony, by the way, is the newest uh, Outsource Pharma Advisory Board member. So welcome to the, to the board, Tony. Um, let's, uh, let's jump right into your supply chain mini case study. Sure. Thanks very much, Lewis. Uh, very excited to be joining the board, by the way. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, the supply chain story I have has both a happy and an unhappy ending. And despite that, I hope it never happens to anyone. Uh, so the, the context here is we were about to move into uh, expand into uh, pediatric trials of a drug that's used to treat uh, or a candidate treatment for a, a common respiratory uh, virus that's uh, seasonal in nature. Uh, please keep that in mind. That'll become important in a few moments. And uh, as a part of this, of course, you know, there's the drug product itself, which is a, a suspension, you know, a syrup. Uh, any of us who've had small children who are sick, you know, have done the same thing, uh, taking an oral syringe and delivering it, you know, to your child like that. And that was the plan uh, for this drug, for these pediatric trials. And so uh, many months prior, there was a, an oral syringe that had been selected and then uh, not thought much uh, about since uh, because that box had been checked. So fast forwarding a little bit, uh, the clinical group had come up with a, a fine idea. Uh, and, and that was to not have parents or caregivers show up day after day uh, to the to the clinical trial site uh, to have their child dosed is that they would send the parents home with several pre-filled uh, syringes that would have been you know filled by the pharmacist and then sent home with the, the parents and, and the caregivers uh, and that was a great idea because that as I mentioned minimized the inconvenience of bringing your sick child into the clinic every day uh, for their because this was a once a day dose and it also reduced uh, the probability that uh, parents or caregivers could possibly misdose their child at home, uh, dispensing an incorrect amount of the, uh, the suspension into the oral syringe. Uh, what had been overlooked uh, is that when the clinical trial uh, team you know, changed their plan, just at that two millimeter shift, uh, the CMC team didn't go back and look at that syringe again. And what happened was, uh, when the thought came to, to turn attention to the syringe again, uh, many months had elapsed. And we realized that that syringe had only been qualified by the manufacturer for immediate use, meaning that it can't have product contact for more than 24 hours. Uh, now that wasn't necessarily the end of the world. What it did mean is that we had to very quickly go out uh, and find a, a CDMO who could do extractables and leachables testing on that to make sure it was qualified for more than immediate use. And, you know, as, as Murphy's Law, I think as uh, George Susan mentioned, Murphy's Law struck and it struck hard and there was an extractables and leachables problem. And uh, despite doing some toxicological assessments, uh, et cetera, we had a combination of, a, of not enough regulatory guidance and especially for uh, pediatric use where uh, it, this has seemed way too risky. And so what we had to do, and again, this was in the middle of COVID, the, the height of the COVID pandemic, is go out and source another syringe and qualify it for more than immediate use because we found there, there were no oral syringes out there qualified for anything more than immediate use uh, because our situation was rather unusual. So we had a, a twofold problem. Uh, the first was that time was running out. Uh, we had to go through all the contracting activities for the, the testing CDMO to do the, the ENL testing. And then also update uh, the clinical plan, the pharmacy manual, et cetera, after that. And there was no guarantee that there wouldn't be an extractables and leachables problem in the new syringe that we selected. Uh, on top of that, as I mentioned, this was in the middle of the, the, the worst of the COVID pandemic when syringes of any type were very difficult to come by. Uh, so we had a hard time just getting suppliers to respond to us. And when they did, uh, there are no, you know, sampler packs of uh, syringe that, the syringes that you can buy. So we had to buy these thousands at a time uh, with long lead times. And uh, I'll come back to the, the seasonal nature of this uh, illness that we were uh, trying to treat in this trial. 
uh, it tracks very well with flu. And so it's very predictable when it comes. Uh, it starts in, let's say, late November, peaks in late December to early January, and, and tails off fairly quickly from there. So unlike other types of uh, supply chain hiccups that may delay your trials by, say, weeks to months, uh, a matter of delaying these trials by even a few weeks would have been disastrous because much like a, a rocket's launch window, you miss the launch window for uh, the season that this virus appears, and you would miss either some or all of your potential patient population, uh, and you would have to wait an entire year for the, the next season to roll around, you know, next winter. And you can imagine that that chews into the, uh, the shelf life of your drug product. And it also does not make the board of directors nor investors too happy. <laughs> so we scrambled and wound up uh, thankfully identifying an oral syringe uh, that met all of our requirements, uh, got qualified for more than you know, immediate use. And so that's the, the happy ending. Uh, the unhappy part of this ending is that for the, the poor CMC team, it was a death march uh, because we knew that we couldn't delay uh, at all. We had zero room to maneuver. And so it created a, a lot of stress, a lot of tension, um, frankly, a lot of bad blood and contributed to the, the weakening of the, the CMC function at this company. Uh, it definitely contributed to some departures, you know, that were you know, much earlier than expected. Uh, so in this case, it was a win for patients, uh, definitely. Uh, we kept that uh, trial, you know, opportunity available. Uh, and unfortunately, it all came at the cost of, you know, the, the, the inner part of the company itself. So uh, one of the lessons here is that, you know, those of us in CMC often, you know, complain that the clinical group uh, doesn't keep us uh, as informed as closely as uh, we might like them to. In fact, Lewis, you published uh, an editorial a while ago uh, with another guest that you know, CMC is like the Rodney Dangerfield of the pharma world. Right. Well, CMC has its own Rodney Dangerfield and that's called supply chain. Uh, <laughs> we don't, in CMC, often don't pay enough attention to supply chain. We're so focused on the drug substance and the drug product that we forget uh, it's a part of a larger kit that's supplied uh, to the pharmacies. And in this case, that kit included uh, the, the oral syringe. Very good. That is, uh, that, that's uh, an intriguing uh, little story there, Tony. Thank, thank you very much. Luck, lucky for the patients, um, but as you said, uh, some very hard lessons learned internal to, to the CMC team and, and, the, and the clinical team as well. 